Okay, our last uh, talk for this session prior to the Q&A is by Kevin Gassemi, who is Assistant Clinical Professor of Medicine at UCLA. He's the Associate Director of the Clinical Programs portion of the Esophageal Disorders Program, and has developed a keen interest in the understanding and treatment of patients with eosinophilic esophagitis, which I don't know about your practice, but in ours, it's a disorder that seems to have erupted like a volcano in our, in our clinical practice. So, Kevin. All right, good morning. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to speak on this topic. My unofficial topic will be uh, catching up time-wise uh, for the morning session. Uh, so, let's see. So the topic is, are we gonna dilate, are we gonna use drugs, or are we gonna diet? So just a brief talk on the background of eosinophilic esophagitis, EOE for short, and then I'm gonna debate myself uh, whether medications, elimination diets, or esophageal dilation is the appropriate way to go. So just the background, uh, EOE really is a manifestation of esophageal dysfunction. The symptoms such as dysphagia to solid foods, food impaction, even heartburn, uh, these are all related to motility disturbances. And you can have also resulting uh, physical obstruction as well. So diagnosis is made with esophageal biopsies. You want to make sure that you take biopsies from both the proximal and distal esophagus, separate the biopsies, and you want to see greater than 15 EOs per high-powered field. And the more biopsies you take, the greater the chances are that you're going to pick up this disorder. Uh, it's isolated to the esophagus, and it's important that you treat these patients with PPIs to rule out either concomitant reflux or also this subcategory of EOE or a separate entity, if you want to think of it that way, called PPI res, uh, resp <clears throat> responsive esophageal eosinophilia. Uh, you want to make sure you've ruled out other causes of eosinophilia, such as uh, drug-induced effects, uh, IBD, uh, certain types of infections. And really a marker of uh, this disorder is a response to either elimination diet or steroid therapy. So before we talk about the three items, I want to just pose to you three patients who I have in my practice and think about how you would treat each one of these. So first case is a 28-year-old woman who experiences dysphagia to solid foods once a week. And when you scope her, you see the classic features of EOE. You see uh, the linear furrows and the circular rings. And just a key feature of her is that she already has a documented uh, anaphylactic response to dairy products. Case two is a 17-year-old girl, uh, solid food dysphagia twice a month, pretty similar uh, endoscopic appearance. And of course, she comes with her mother, um, who is very concerned about her having to take medications for this disorder, either short or long term. And then the final case is a 39-year-old guy who was referred to me for solid food dysphagia. And first picture on the left, you almost think you're in the trachea. Then you get down further, you know you're in the esophagus, and you see a tight stricture. It's dilated from 8 millimeters to 10 millimeters. You tell him to come back and see you to discuss medication therapy. You don't see him for over a year, and then he has recurrent symptoms. So those are three actually fairly classic patients. Um, so the first topic we'll talk about uh, in terms of therapies is our drugs. A little bit of background on drugs. The mainstay of therapy for EOE is... Uh, topical swallowed uh, steroids. And this uh, can be done either as a swallowed inhaler form, such as fluticasone, usually uh, two puffs twice a day uh, for two to three months. The other option that's a little bit more recent is oral viscous budesonide, taking the respules and mixing it with some sugar substitute. Uh, the studies have used sucralose and doing that one milligram twice a day. And the treatment course is for two to three months, as I mentioned. Now, this is, does a pretty good job of inducing remission, and I'll talk about the positive side uh, points in just a moment, but what do you do after two to three months? Well, maintenance has not been really clearly defined. Um, there's really only one study that has clearly looked at this with oral viscous budesonide, and what they used was 25% of the um, um, induction dose. 
but there's real no reason why they didn't use 50%, they just used 25%. And they found that 65% uh, of these patients stayed in clinical remission compared to the placebo group. Um, so a much higher, a significant response. And then um, there actually was found to be a reduction in the mucosal thickness, suggesting that it, this might reduce or reverse uh, fibrosis with long-term therapy. I'll bring up just a couple of other treatment options, which aren't really all that great or haven't been clearly defined to have a benefit. Montelicast is actually more of um, an anecdotal type of thing. There's really only two studies in the literature. One which was uh, a study of eight patients um, who had diagnosed EOE, then they were treated with supra high doses um, up to 100 milligrams and were just assessed by symptom response. And seven of eight patients got better, but we don't know how they looked like on the inside. Then there was a maintenance study that after patients got induced with steroids, they were put on Montelucast, everyone relapsed. So it's not really a great option, but you'll hear of some people having a response. It's just not been well studied otherwise. Monoclonal antibodies have been used in very limited numbers. One of them, omalizumab, is an anti-IgE uh, antibody, and then mepolizumab is um, against interleukin-5. And in very small studies, they've had fairly mixed results. For the most part, symptoms don't seem to improve. It, there may be a little bit of a reduction in eosinophil counts, but are we treating the patient or are we treating the eosinophils? We don't know that. What's really the best outcome? So let's start by taking the pro side of steroids. Well, they work. We have a lot of studies that show that they work. They reduce the eosinophil counts. Um, in almost all of the studies, it's been shown to improve symptoms, and there's a suggestion that this might actually reverse fibrosis. They're also safe. No significant adverse rep uh, events have been reported, and because it's a topical steroid, just like uh, inhaling a steroid for asthma, there's very little or no systemic absorption. And this can be used intermittently for milder cases. You treat for two to three months, they do well, maybe they come back several months or even a few years later with symptoms, you treat them again for two to three months. So it's a great, a great uh, on-demand type of uh, treatment option. But they may not be the, the best option because the symptom response is unpredictable. And there was a recent study just about a couple of years ago that showed that while it did induce a reduction in the number of eosinophils, there was no significant improvement in dysphagia comp compared to placebo. Um, esophageal candidiasis is the most common reported adverse effect, but by and large it's asymptomatic. However, up to 25% of patients might have this um, on a repeat endoscopy. And it isn't a great long-term therapy um, for some people, and if you stop it, most likely it's going to come back. By one year, almost 90% of people have recurrence of symptoms. Okay, let's move on to dietary therapy. Just a little bit of background of the dietary therapy. So starting off with the elemental diet, this has actually been used quite widely in the pediatric population, particularly the very young. And this is a free amino acid-based formula, and in the pediatric population, 95 to 98 percent of people will have an improvement in eosinophils and symptoms. In the adults, it's good but not as robust. Over 70 percent would show a complete response based on the eosinophil counts. But in some other studies, there actually wasn't an improvement in the dysphagia scores or with regard to heartburn. And it's a really tough diet to adhere to, this elemental diet. It tastes pretty poor, and in the studies, about 40 percent of patients dropped out. There's also been suggested that if you send the patient to an allergist and they get tested either by skin prick or atopy patch testing, you might be able to uh, narrow down what you need to avoid, have the patient avoid taking. And there was one study by Spurgle that showed that up to 53% of patients would respond to um, an allergy testing directed food elimination. Problem is that this um, predictability, high level of predictability, Ability hasn't been reproduced. In fact, more recent studies have shown that only about 10 to 15 percent of patients can you predict uh, what allergen they're going to need to avoid. So what's become really the most popular um, option is the six food elimination diet. So you'll see pictures of these on the right, but the most allergenic foods are wheat, dairy, soy, nuts, um, eggs, and seafood. And this is a six-week uh, elimination of these six common foods. And the studies from Northwestern and even in Spain show that there was about a 70 to 75 percent improvement based on eosinophil count reduction. And actually 90 plus percent of people had an improvement in their dysphagia scores. Um, then what happens after the six weeks is you reintroduce the food groups one at a time. 
And what they found was that wheat and dairy were the most common, 60 and 50 percent respectively, and then there's a big drop off. Nuts uh, and soy are about 10 percent, eggs 5 percent, and seafood didn't even show up. Um, in the Spanish study, they actually looked to see how many patients um, had um, allergies to more than one food, and it was kind of about a third of one, one food allergen, a third with two, and a third with three or more. So this can also become kind of cumbersome if you find that you have to eliminate several foods. So why should you uh, choose dietary elimination as an option? Well, by and large, this is a disorder of young people. And it's tough to get a young person to commit to a medication for the rest of their life, especially the ones who don't want to be worried about long-term side effects, whether it's um, risk of long-term systemic absorption, even if it is a topical steroid. So this is a dietary and lifestyle change is something that may seem more appealing to them. It may also be thought of as a second line therapy for the people who don't respond to uh, topical steroids or who are frequent relapsers and you want to keep them from having to um, use steroids continuously or um, repeat the courses frequently. But there are also some downsides to this. First of all, uh, kind of like celiac disease, if you reintroduce the food, the problem is going to come back. So it's not a cure. Um, you're just avoiding the uh, trigger. Um, it also is difficult to predict the food, so you have to do pretty much trial and error, and that can take a while and be a little bit cumbersome. There can be an impact on the quality of life, particularly if you find that you need to uh, avoid more than one food group, you start to become quite limited. And wheat and dairy are the most common, and wheat seems to be found in almost everything. And another thing to keep in mind is dairy, it's not the lactose, it's actually the milk proteins, which can be hidden in a lot of foods, um, so you have to be careful of that. And then finally, we'll talk about dilation. So dilation has actually been the longest treatment for adult eosinophilic esophagitis when it was first thought of as ringed esophagus. The goal here is to dilate the area or areas of maximal narrowing. Um, and this can be done either with uh, the bougie dilators or with a balloon through the scope. Essentially what you want to do is you want to inflate the balloon or pass the dilators in sequentially increasing sizes until you develop resistance or see blood. You want to look for a mucosal break because that's a marker that you've broken up the mucosal scar tissue. It used to be thought that a mucosal tear was um, an adverse effect, but really that's the end point that you're shooting for. Uh, the literature suggests that your goal diameter should be 15 to 18 millimeters, and I put the corresponding French sizes, but just keep in mind that it's generally thought of that 12 millimeters is the minimum uh, diameter necessary uh, to avoid significant dysphagia. And you don't want to try to go from, say, 10 millimeters to 15 millimeters or whatever you're shooting for in one shot because that's going to increase the risk of perforation. You want to do this sequentially, so you might have to bring the patient back over several sessions. So when should you dilate? Well, this is a great way to provide immediate improvement um, of their dysphagia. And uh, it takes care of the fibrous stenotic component. And in general, it is pretty well tolerated. Um, patients will report that they're feeling better right away. They're able to eat things that they couldn't eat before. In fact, that picture of the guy who uh, had an eight millimeter stricture, he didn't come back for a year and he said he was getting dehydrated because he was just eating burgers all the, all the time and avoided liquids. Um, it seems to also work for quite a while. The median uh, duration of symptom improvement is about 15 months and most studies suggest that it's at least a year. Um, problem is, you're not treating the underlying problem, you're just treating a resulting complication uh, of the ongoing inflammation. Furthermore, there is a risk of complications. Uh, chest pain is the most common. It's usually um, self-limited results within a couple of days, um, but it can be reported as high as 75%. Perforation was the most feared complication. It probably still is the most feared complication, but fortunately, it's a lot less common than was initially feared. Uh, mainly because we don't dilate these the same way that we would dilate Schottsky rings or even peptic strictures. So the risk is actually quite close to just the general risk of endoscopy causing perforation. And I just wanted to show an example of why this might be kind of feared. This is another, this is a lady who had a proximal esophageal stricture dilated from 8 to 10. And there was this big mucosal tear that was about 5 centimeters long. She actually complained of chest pain and neck pain because it was a proximal stricture for five days. Uh, but fortunately, she recovered and she was eating quite well afterwards. 
So really, what's the best option? And the answer is, it really just it depends. It needs to be individualized to the patient. This is something where you have to talk with your patient about the options and determine what's really the best option for them. But some general rules of thumb, if you have a young patient who is interested in avoiding medications, is more interested in lifestyle change, this might be the best person for a food elimination diet. And it's important to get a dietitian involved, one who knows quite well the pitfalls of these kinds of disorders and maybe can help to tailor um, a dietary elimination um, uh, protocol. In fact, at UCLA, what we do is we have them avoid wheat and dairy first because those are the two most common groups and that might help reduce uh, the impairment and quality of life because you still give them food options rather than cutting out six food groups. Uh, if someone has frequent relapses, you might want to consider these patients for maintenance steroids. Um, and a food elimination diet may also be appropriate here because you're trying to avoid the ongoing trigger. And then finally, for the fibrostenotic phenotype, you might want to dilate these people early. It'll give them immediate relief. And then you'd probably also want to consider them for uh, maintenance topical steroids to keep them from getting back into the situation that brought them with a food impaction or whatnot. And with that, I thank you for your time.